So to my left is a gentleman who has presented with us for many years. I think when I first started, I, I, I met you, and it was just in design, built out an amazing studio, and he's here to present and share some of his work with you. So let's give a big round of applause to Barton Damer from Already Been Chewed TV. Hey. Hello. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, thank you, of course, to Maxon for having us out and allowing us to be able to showcase some of our work. Um, again, my name is Barton Damer. I am the owner and founding artist. Let me get this mic a little bit closer here. I'm the owner and founding artist of a studio called Already Been Chewed. You can find us on the internet at www.alreadybeenchewed.tv. Uh, we're also very uh, active on Instagram, posting a lot of behind the scenes renders, uh, clay renders, hardware previews, and kind of peeling back some of the layers behind the beautiful 3D renders that you might see and removing some of the mystery. So if you're interested in following us there, it's at already been chewed on Instagram. We are on Facebook as well. However, uh, Facebook is for old people. And so we don't interact there quite as much. At least that's what my kids tell me. So uh, anyway, uh, you can find us on either Instagram or Facebook. My personal is uh, at Barton Damer as well. Um, feel free to direct message me, uh, slide into my DMs. I'm there all the time. Happy to answer uh, if I can. Uh, emailing, if you email me, it'll get lost in an abyss of other emails. So uh, I would recommend, and don't be shy if you want to reach out, uh, to hit me up on uh, Instagram DMs. Um, as Matthias mentioned, uh, Maxon acquired Redshift, which we are very excited about as a studio. Uh, we have started using Redshift Renderer about two years ago or so. Uh, and so today, we're actually going to be talking about using Redshift with uh, a new uh, feature that um, Maxon introduced in R20 called Fields. And so some of the animations that we're going to uh, look at today, if you're familiar with the Adobe Suite, either Photoshop or Illustrator, maybe you're brand new to Cinema 4D, you're going to see some very complex animations. You might even assume that maybe they were done in Houdini. You hear a lot about Houdini animations and how cool those are. Um, and, but what you're going to find out is uh, how simple some of these animations were created using fields and just a little bit of knowledge of Illustrator and Photoshop. Uh, before we get into that, though, I want to tell you a little bit more uh, about our studio. So this is our team. Uh, we have Aaron, Thomas, Tom, uh, myself in the middle, Brian, uh, Fancher, who's actually in the crowd with us today, uh, and Donnie, and Lance. And then not shown in this photo is my wife, and she plays a huge role in our studio. She keeps all of our finances in check. Uh, works with our accountants to make sure that the IRS does not throw me in jail over a $300 discrepancy. Uh, so she has arguably the most important job out of all of us uh, and super thankful to her. Um, this is our studio space. It is a building that was built in the late 1800s. Uh, it was really important to me as we were building out company culture. Uh, I wanted to be in a place that I felt um, would be exciting or just a really cool spot to hang out. And uh, we just happened to make really cool digital artwork in this space. And so I didn't want our studio to be like carpet and cubicles. Um, I wanted it to feel almost like an art gallery, uh, but even more so like a sneaker shop, because uh, that's kind of the stuff that I'm into. So. Um, uh, it's a little bit about our space and, and where we work. Next, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you our motion graphics reel. If you're not familiar with what a motion graphics reel is, it's going to be about a minute and a half video that's edited together with a variety of projects that, uh, that we might consider some of our favorite projects. Also, I want to mention that in this reel, I'm pretty excited because with the exception of a few shots, almost all of this work has been done in the last 12 months or so. So that's pretty exciting.
Uh, so that's our newest body of work. Thank you. Then again, thanks to our amazing team and our clients that have allowed us to really push ourselves creatively. Um, we're just having a ton of fun. And every time a new release comes out, uh, I don't mean to say this is like a salesy thing, but like R20 was groundbreaking for me personally. Like I looked at the new features, I looked at fields, and I got just really excited about what we could pull off. Uh, we dove into fields heavily as a team, um, you know, just making sure it was like, this is a game changer. Like we need to learn fields, we need to understand fields, and we need to start using it regularly. So we've been doing fields as much as possible, uh, squeezing it into our projects. And we're going to look at uh, one of the very first projects we did with Fields right after R20 came out. It's a project for New Balance. You saw some of it in the motion graphics reel. Um, this was basically the only input and request from the client as far as um, artistically. They had an old retro ad that they wanted us to incorporate that vibe into a, uh, a feature-driven video for a new shoe. It was a Brandon Westgate shoe. Uh, he's a professional skateboarder, and so we had to keep in mind several things. One, we wanted to stay true to kind of like the old school vibe uh, of the ad, and to me that meant a couple things as I looked at this ad. Um, I noticed that the shoe itself is, you know, perpendicular to the camera. Uh, it's not this like three-quarter uh, like perspective view. There's not a whole lot of depth on it. And then also as you look uh, on the tread as well, it's like flat to the camera, right? So it wasn't like, you know, coming at the camera or doing like these crazy, you know, interesting angles necessarily, but there was definitely like a style that had been established in this ad that we wanted to stay true to. So as we developed the creative brief, we started thinking about how we could show off the shoe uh, and without camera cuts, we could go from very tight on the shoe, but then we could do slides and then we could slide up and we could see the tread and then we could slide over and then we could see like a portion of the toe. And so that was kind of the concept that we were working with. And as we were doing that, we would show off features of the shoe in hopefully a very interesting way. So let's take a look at that spot and then we'll talk more about it. So you'll notice that the audio kind of came to an abrupt end, and that was part of the design. So what we did was we created not only the visuals, but the audio to be able to loop seamlessly. That way, when it was posted on Instagram, somebody could watch it through, and they might actually see the features two or three times before they even realized that the video had repeated itself. And so uh, trade shows where there might be audio, POP displays inside of a store, this video could seamlessly loop and go through the features uh, again, and, and somebody might watch it one and a half, two times before they even realized like, oh, this repeated. So that was also part of uh, the concept in, in creating this. So as we go through this video, what we're going to talk about as far as fields uh, were involved, we're going to look at the technique for how the tread uh, came through here and began to bloat as well as emit kind of a yellow hue from this into cushioning system. So uh, fields uh, were used for this, and we're going to take a, uh, a deeper dive into how that was accomplished. We're also going to, going to come to this uh, section here where the toe cap is, and we're going to look at how fields were used to create uh, this complicated animation. And again, if you're just joining us, um, I mentioned earlier, if you know Illustrator and Photoshop even just a little bit, you're going to be surprised that you could come away from this tutorial and you would be able to do this exact animation uh, with just a little bit of knowledge of Cinema 4D if you know how to do just a few things in Illustrator and Photoshop that we're uh, going to look at. So one thing you'll notice about this video, um, again, we kept it kind of in, um, in the theme of the ad that they provided for us, the retro ad, where... Uh, we really needed to show restraint in this type of a video. We did not feel that for skateboarders uh, that we should be doing uh, essentially shoe porn, you know, like getting in 
tight and sexy and depth of field and crazy lighting and stuff like that. We didn't feel like that would necessarily be the right solution for the target audience. So um, even though we were doing some, some really cool, interesting uh, animations, we had to kind of show that restraint and stick to the vibe of, of the print ad. That being said, in general, as a studio, we have issues, as in issues. Uh, and so we had to, we couldn't help ourselves. We had to do behind the scenes renders and, uh, and create some of that shoe porn to be able to reveal some of these techniques. So I'll show you a little bit of a behind the scenes uh, edit here. Okay, so now that we have these different angles, again, this is what we're going to start looking at and how we did this technique uh, for the tread using fields. Uh, and then also we'll jump in here and we're going to look at how we used fields to create this technique. Okay, so let's jump into Cinema 4D. Uh, while we're here, what I'd like to do is just show you the file. Um, and you'll just see like a basic playback inside of Cinema's window. This is where the shoe comes together. And at this point, this is where uh, all of the animation across the toe cap will happen. Uh, so let's jump in and from scratch, let's create the tread and begin animating the tread. So uh, what I'm gonna do now is I am going to drop a plane in here. And if you're not familiar with Redshift, what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up the Redshift render view. Redshift is a third-party photorealistic render engine, no longer third-party. Uh, it is now owned by Maxon. Um, so uh, you open up this uh, live render view, and then right now it doesn't look like a whole lot. But what we'll do is we'll start dropping in just some basic lighting and things like that uh, so that we can do a little bit of look development but not get too, too carried away. You can see as I drop in a light, it's pointing the other direction. I'm just going to rotate it a little bit here. And then I'm going to slide it back. And you can see how it's illuminating the plane right now. And then I'll come into the light and I have different settings. I'll increase the intensity. So we've got a, a little more light there. Let's just add a little bit of warmth to it. So I can add color to my lights, of course. Uh, so now what we want to do is we want to focus on how we were using displacement uh, to animate these treads, and again, using fields. So the first thing we're going to do is create a redshift material. So Redshift has its own material set, it's the same way as it has its own lighting. When we go into the materials, we're going to go into a node editor. Um, my first experience with nodes was actually using Redshift. Uh, I was a little bit intimidated at first because I had never used nodes before, uh, but I will say that I don't mind nodes now. Um, I like it. I, I, you know, I, I have certain nodes that I'm comfortable with, others I'm not quite sure what they do. Um, but I would encourage you to get used to the node system because once you know a little bit more about it, um, it it's really powerful. Uh, so let's focus on getting some displacement in here uh, and, and creating our initial tread. So the first thing I want to do is I'm going to type in displacement. I'm going to start setting up a displacement. So I drag this node to my output displacement. And then what I want to do is I want to bring a texture in. And I'm working with a grayscale image for my texture. And so I will plug this into my texture map. And so now what I do is I can load basically any grayscale image I want to in, uh, into uh, that texture node. And you'll notice if I, uh, let's do this. 
I'm going to go ahead and plug this in, and then I'm going to click this to make it larger. Okay, so here's where the Illustrator and Photoshop comes into place. So uh, we created this uh, in Illustrator. Uh, shout out to Joe Meyer, who did the modeling of this shoe for us. Um, and so in Illustrator, you, know, you can create literally any pattern you want. It can be complex. It can be simple. Uh, and one thing to note about displacements is wherever it is 50% gray, uh, nothing is going to displace up or down. If it is white, it's going to displace up. If it's black, it's going to displace down. So we're able to create this in Illustrator and then plug it in to create uh, a displaced tread. So let's take a look at that. A couple things are going to happen here that we need to look at. First thing, when I drag this onto my plane, you'll notice that it's going to be super shiny. What it's doing is it's reflecting the light source, which is just a big square light. Uh, so I don't want to dive into, um, uh, into making the textures too, uh, too perfect. There's a lot, of, uh, a lot of things that we could look at, uh, but I, I want to kind of skip past that a little bit um, to focus on the animation side of things. So what we're going to do is we're just going to bring uh, the weight down here. As we bring the weight down in the reflectance, you can see it got lighter. Let's see if I can move this up. OK, and then I'm going to adjust the roughness. As I adjust the roughness, you can see it's getting nice and kind of blurry, feeling a little bit more like maybe a uh, shiny rubber sole. So uh, we'll just stick with that texture for now. Uh, we've got our displacement loaded in here. You'll notice it's not doing anything yet. The reason for that is because we need what's called a redshift tag and a uh, redshift object tag. When we bring the redshift object tag on, we want to click override. Uh, excuse me, we want to go to geometry, click override. We want to enable tessellation, and we want to uh, enable displacement. <coughs> now, my displacement tag is on my light. Let's pull it over here to my plane. And now you can see my tread is showing up. If I go into the maximum displacement and the displacement scale, I'm just going to increase this to say like a 10. Now you can see it's displacing, uh, but the edges look, look pretty bad. Uh, so what we can do is we can adjust minimum edge length and maximum subdivisions. And you can kind of tweak those uh, until you get something a little more interesting uh, or a little bit better looking. Right now, it's a, it looks a lot better. Um, but there's still some issues with it. Um, mainly, in, in 3D, if you have no rounded edges whatsoever, it's typically going to look fake. Because something in real life, even if it's very sharp, like the edge of this plexiglass, it's still going to have a little bit of a rounding to it. Uh, and so right now, we don't have that. Um, so we're not catching any kind of light highlights. We're not catching any shadows or anything like that. So here's uh, uh, a simple solve for that. And here's where the Photoshop comes in. Uh, again, just trying to relate to people that are familiar with the Adobe Suite and maybe newer to Cinema 4D. Um, so what we can do here is we can pull up a blurred version of, uh, of it. And I'll just pull this up. So now you can see I simply took in my Illustrator file into Photoshop, gave it a little bit of a Gaussian blur, and then loaded it back into Cinema as my displacement map. And now you can see it's a little bit more realistic looking after having loaded that in. We are getting some lights. Let me, uh, hitting the edges and some shadows. Let me go in a little bit closer here. We can. OK, so while we're at this stage, Let's look at uh, a few tweaks to some look development before we go too much further. Uh, first thing I want to point out is that we have our own set, our own settings for Redshift. If I go to Redshift, I do want to turn on Global Illumination. It renders incredibly fast. So if you're not familiar with Global Illumination, it's basically light that bounces off of and reflects on different surfaces. Um, so Global illumination is going to help it to be a little bit more photorealistic. Right now, there's not a lot for uh, light to bounce around and hit because we only have one directional light. So uh, what we'll do to solve that is we're going to go into redshift, light, dome light. When we drop a dome light in, essentially, right now, it is using all white. 
Um, and we can disable the background. I don't necessarily want to see a white background, but it's still going to illuminate it. I'll go into my exposure and I'll pull my exposure down. And so now I'm getting uh, almost like a fill light, but I still have a directional light giving it some shadows. And then while we're at this point, let's just add in a redshift camera. Do a standard camera. And then what I want to do is I'm just going to add a quick keyframe here to hold the position of it. I'm going to go into the redshift tag, and I'm going to add some depth of field. This is another amazing thing uh, that we can, we can render and render quickly. We don't have to add depth of field in post anymore. If you're used to that back in the day, um, we would add depth of field in After Effects to our 3D renders um, after the fact because it was just way too slow. Uh, to do it in camera inside of cinema and render, but now it is very fast as you're seeing. I'm going to go into what's called my focus distance here, and I, if I click this arrow, I can choose whatever point I want to focus on. And now I've got some very nice uh, depth of field happening on the tread of this shoe. Okay, so now that we're at this stage, now we're going to start working with fields and animating these things. So. Um, let's see. First thing I want to do is I want to make this editable so that I can add a vertex map. So I just hit the C key, now it's editable. I'm going to go into point mode, and then I'm going to hit Shift C that brings up a search, and I'm going to type in uh, set uh, vertex weight, comes up. I'm just going to double click that. I'm going to click OK. And now I have uh, this vertex map. Vertex maps are not new. However, what is new is this little button right here, use fields. And so this is, to me, where it gets really exciting. We have the fields. And then we have all these different options now inside of fields. You can look at everything from all these different types of fields. You've got different solid type of uh, effects you can add to it. You've got this clamp. So there's tons of options to explore within fields. The one we're going to look at first is this uh, spherical field. And so now, when we add this spherical field, you can see uh, that it, it gives you kind of like a red base and, and yellow. Uh, and so the vertex map is going to drive fields based off of where the red is and based off of where the yellow is. So what we're going to end up doing is we're going to have another displacement that we're going to use for basically bloating the tread itself. Uh, real quick before I do that, I'm just going to scale this up a little bit. Okay, so let's go back into our texture. And so we've already got a displacement set up. What we can do is we can select those. We can hold down Control, and it makes an exact copy of it so we don't have to like, pull them back in and, and, and redo that. I'm going to show you uh, what the new displacement's going to look like. So I'll connect this. And then we're going to add a different image here. So um, what we're going to do is we're going to take this image that we created in Illustrator, and as we talked about earlier, you know, we've got the grays, the whites, and the blacks. Well, we want everything to kind of bloat upwards. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to get rid of the black, and so we're going to create uh, a, a, our own kind of uh, displacement map that's just all white based off of the same tread pattern. So when we plug this in, now you can see it's starting to bloat the way we want it to. Uh, let's go back into our displacement tag, and let's exaggerate that quite a bit. Let's take this to uh, 50, and let's take this to 50. And then when we come back, OK, so now you can see it is, uh, it is raising up quite a bit. Um, and it's starting to look pretty cool. However, it still doesn't feel like it's bloated. It just kind of like went straight up. So relatively easy solve for that. I'm going to load 
this, and then we'll take a higher look, closer look at it. So using the exact same tread pattern, using Illustrator and Photoshop, went in and just closed the gaps and made them real tiny. And then we're able to use like layer maps, uh, excuse me, layer modes inside of um, Photoshop, do like an inner glow with like a light gray and fill those in so that we've got a little bit of a gradient happening. So with that gradient, what it's going to do is it's going to allow it to be like this rather than like straight up and over. So we load this in as our new displacement map. And when we do that, now you can see we have something that's closer to what we want for the spot. I'm going to move my camera down a little bit. And now you can see it's starting to bloat a lot better. Uh, we're also starting to get what looks like almost like wrinkles uh, in the tread. So just to, to reiterate what we're trying to, to create here, we are going for this. And so this exact thing uh, was displaced the way we just showed you, but we've got to solve for how do we go from how do we go from the tread looking like this, animating it into the bloated version that we just created. Okay, so let's go back and talk about the next steps for that that blend. So. Uh, that's actually exactly what we're going to do. We're going to use what's called a um, displace blender. So I'm going to remove these wires and I'm going to add a node. I'm just going to type in blender here. Displacement. And then what I want to do is I want my base layer to be the input. So my base layer is going to be the tread. Okay. And then I want my next layer, which would be layer zero, I want that to be like the bloating displacement that we just created. But right now, it doesn't know when to bloat or when to show tread. So we have to tell it how to, how to do that. And that's where our vertex map comes in. So the vertex map that we just created and applied fields to it, We're going to come in here, and we're going to tell it to be the displacement weight of layer 0. So it's going to look at the red value or the yellow value, and it's going to blend the displacements between wherever the red value is and the yellow value. So let's look. We've got to reconnect it. Otherwise, we'll have no results whatsoever. And if I did everything correctly, we don't have any results. The reason for that is we've got to plug in an actual vertex map. So right now, there is nothing there. However, if I take my vertex map and I drag it right here, now when we go to update it, you can see it's bloating only in the section. Let's go and actually see our vertex map here. It is bloating only in the section that's yellow. So if I come over here, let it refresh. Now it's going to bloat over there. The next thing we want to look at is right now, it doesn't necessarily look like it's bloating. It just kind of looks like it's the same level, if not like shrinking down. So the cool thing about this is we can control the displacement on both, all within the exact same redshift material. So we can go to our first displacement, which is the tread. And let's just take the scale down to say 0.25. And so now we can bloat it. And wherever we move this, it's going to follow it. See how we do that? OK, so if you are not familiar with animation in cinema, uh, I'll just do this very quickly. Essentially, we can take the location of our spherical field. And uh, I'm going to close this. See, as we moved it off, there's no bloating at that point. We will just add a keyframe here. And then when we bring it over to, say, 45 frames later, we're going to slide it down there. And then if I play it back, you'll just see simple animation of that spherical field. It runs across. And so the bloating is going to follow wherever we move that spherical field. So if I were to render that out, it would look like this.
But right now, this just kind of goes, but we could actually co go in and control it so that it could like bloat a little bit and bounce a little bit. So for example, let's go back here. And as you watch it, as you watch it blow, you'll see that it also kind of flickers and goes in and out. So that's what we want to work on adding right now, is how there's a little extra movement to it. So let's look at how we add that technique in, because <clears throat> we don't have to do anything time consuming or challenging on our part, as far as we don't have to keyframe that. Uh, we don't have to write code to be able to pull it off. We simply go back into our field, and now we're going to add, um, excuse me, we're going to add the delay effector. So in the delay effector, we're going to choose uh, spring. And so what this will do is I mean, it's going to add a delay to it. So uh, as it goes like this, essentially it's going to go like this, and then it's going to follow behind it slowly with like a slow jiggle. Um, and so what you would want to do is, depending on how much of like that springiness you want, you would control this to be lower or higher. Uh, and so if we do this, I believe we could probably see some of the results in the vertex map here. So you can see with that much of a delay, it's delaying, delaying, and it's lighter and lighter each time. And then if I pull it down to say like 50, so I play it back, it's going to go delay, delay. So what that's going to do, if we render that out, is now it's going to give us this type of an animation. And we didn't have to do anything challenging. We just have to like, tweak those settings until we get exactly what we like. So the next thing we want to look at within this field setup that we have is how did we not only blend the displacement, but we blended the colors as it was displacing. So you can see that we're going from the yellow and the N2 cushion technology, and that yellow is being uh, animated along with the displacement um, as it continues to bloat, and it's only being turned yellow uh, wherever the bloating is happening. And so it goes completely yellow there, and then it comes back and starts to go back to, to brown. So let's look at how we did that. So let's go back into our texture. Uh, let's see. I'm going to pull up my render viewer once again. And now what we're looking at doing is creating the color of the tread and blending it with that yellow. So again, there's a lot more we could go into in the actual texturing of things. But what I would like to do is just kind of quickly change this to be, say, like the brown of the tread, maybe. Uh, let's try something like this. So uh, now we got the brown of the tread. We are going to duplicate this. And we want to set up a color that would be, uh, let's say, just to make sure, connect this. We want this one to be like the yellow. Sorry. OK, so that'll be the yellow. And we want to be able to blend the two, the brown and the yellow. So what we're going to do is we're going to remove these wires. We're going to type in Blender again, except this time we're going to use a Material Blender. When we use a Material Blender, we want to set our base material. So the base color is going to be that brown. And then the color that we want to change it to is going to be that yellow. And that'll be layer color one. Uh, and again, it has nothing to look at or access as to know when it should be brown or when it should be yellow. So our base layer is going to tell it it needs to just be brown. So that's where, once again, we need to pull up our vertex attribute. When we pull up our vertex attribute, then we want to plug this into our layer color 1 and tell it to be the blend color. And so now, um, once again, it's not looking at anything. So we have to drag our vertex map in here 
and once we set that up, you've got yellow where it's bloating and brown where it's not bloating. So we're able to blend two colors like that pretty quickly. So if we were to render that out, what we would see then is something like this. But that's kind of just the beginning. Let's look at what happens when we start adding more interesting textures in and blending between some more interesting textures uh, and some different displacing. So we're going to keep this exact same setup that we have, but we're going to start adding um, different uh, photos. So let me take this color back to 50. So we do zero. And I'm just going to take this one back to 50% gray. And we're going to add a texture node. All right, so when we add this texture node, what we're doing here is we are simply loading a photograph. That photograph, let's go choose it. I'm using a real displacement uh, texture here. If you're not familiar with real displacement textures, they're incredible. You can purchase them online. Um, they come with, as you'll see here, everything from normal maps to reflectance and depth mats. Again, I don't want to focus on the texturing too much, so I'm going to skip plugging in all of the different uh, uh, maps here. Uh, but we are going to just plug in the, uh, like the color. So once we plug this in, <clears throat> see. you'll see what's happening is we've got our, our photograph of, of pebbles here, and then we haven't plugged anything in where the bloating is happening. So uh, let's do another photograph. We're just going to copy this uh, by holding the control key, connect it here, diffuse, and then let's choose another photo of something else. It's another real displacement texture of kind of some mud and tire tracks. Uh, let's, do, let's do this one. Give it a second to refresh. OK, so now you can see we've got the two colors being blended. But let's go ahead and blend the displacements that come with each of those photographs as well. So I've got a. Uh, I've got, uh, let's see, textures. I've got a displacement map for this. Go into the depth, 4K. Going to load this. You'll see as we load it, it's going to go away from the tread, and it's going to go into a displacement of the rocks there. Then as I come into my next one, going to go back and get, uh, let's see, the tire marks depth here. And as I load this, we now have the displacement of the mud. <laughs> and so you can see it's taking shape uh, wherever our setup was, and it's in the sphere there. So obviously, we could go in and we could spend time dialing in the displacement and getting it to look perfect, dialing in like the reflectance, all of those things, getting it to look perfect. But if we were to render this out as is, here's what we're going to get. It's going to be something like this goes across. The issue with this, of course, is that we kind of just have a sphere that animates across. So it's cool that wherever that sphere goes, we've got the mud. And wherever the sphere isn't, we've got the rocks. But we don't necessarily want it to be in the shape of a sphere. Uh, we want to break it up and have it be a little bit more organic. So let's look at how we're going to, to do that. OK, so what I want to do is I want to go back into the field, and I want to add what is called a random, uh, random field. So when we add the random field, you can now see how it affected my vertex map. Not only did it affect my vertex map, but you can see that I now have subtle hints of mud uh, versus rock that are popping up all throughout it. Uh, so it's not just a sphere anymore. We've broken it up. 
um, and it's reading wherever it's red and wherever it's yellow to get us something that's way more organic. What's really cool too about this is you can go into remapping and you can go in and, uh, you know, if you're, again, if you're used to like Photoshop or anything like that, what you'll do is you'll come into this curve mode and you're adjusting kind of the brightness contrast of the map itself. So if we go in here, you can begin to, uh, to adjust the brightness and the contrast of the vertex, which is also going to affect these areas. Uh, so you can make them a harsher edge between the rock and the mud, or you can make it a really soft edge uh, between the rock and the mud. And so if you were to render something like this out, oh, sorry, one, let's see, wanted to mention one other thing about the noise. You can animate the noise as well. So if you put this in, that way as it's growing, uh, it's going to be kind of like creepy crawly growing. And so by adding in this noise, you essentially get, show you one more time, you essentially get the breakup of the toe through here. So the way all of this was animating out, the reason it didn't all animate at one time is because of the noise pattern that was there. And these were animated the exact same way as the tread. Two different displacement maps on the toe. One that was all white that popped it out and one that had more like grays and blacks in it. Uh, and then by adding that random uh, field to everything, it broke it up a little bit more. So if you were to render this out, you would get something that's going to look a little bit more like this. So that way you don't have just a sphere going across, but you've got something a little bit more organic. Here's a further away shot of it. So you can see how cool some of these edges are now and the brightness and contrast of our vertex map uh, that we were adjusting inside of the field are allowing us to get some really interesting growth. So now, if you spend some time on lighting it, put an interesting camera move on it, uh, and dialing in uh, some of the, uh, the fields on it, as far as the settings that we've already applied, you'll get something that looks a little bit more like this. Pretty cool and pretty easy, right? So again, when fields released, I was just beyond excited thinking like, I'm not even sure how I would do this before field. I, have, I literally have no idea. I mean, maybe there's a way, I'm sure there is. Uh, but this to me started feeling like, I felt like I was a Houdini champion, you know? Uh, and it was pretty exciting. Uh, so let's look now at the toe a little bit more because we talked about that briefly. And I just want to, uh, to, to show you just one other technique for that toe. So again, just to make sure that you all are following along as far as what we're, what we're talking about. Show it one more time here. Let's look at this technique on the toe by looking at the file. So. Ah, sorry, window. Okay. If we look at this version, this is the shot again where the shoe comes into frame and then the toe cap starts to, to animate out. Notice a couple things. This is our spherical field uh, that we've been talking about this whole time. You can see our spherical field is running through and it's animating across the toe. And then the other thing to notice is here is our vertex map. So if we click on our vertex map, what we have, if we go back to the beginning here, I'll show this vertex map instead. Sorry, let's play this back. And if we look at our vertex map as that spherical field comes across, You'll notice that there's the noise applied to it, and you can kind of see some of the different levels as it comes across.
So then uh, the other thing to keep in mind is as we were going across this toe and using fields to, to bring those things to life, those things were kind of sticking out at the edges and they were looking not very good. So we had to kind of constrain them around the edges. And so what we're able to do is we're able to combine vertex maps. And so that's where this vertex map comes into place. Uh, you're able to go to character and then paint tool. And when you go to paint tool, you can literally start painting in what you want to be yellow and what you want to be red. And so now, as, uh, as the fields are making the displacement animate out, we can combine both vertex maps so that it's not going to displace anything along the edges. It's only going to displace where the yellow is, but then we've got a nice fall off so that as we're on the toe, it wasn't like sticking out in kind of like a ugly way, uh, but we could solve for it by adding that extra uh, vertex map. The last thing I want to show is, uh, is what we've put together. Like I mentioned on Instagram, we do a lot of behind the scenes edits, uh, showing hardware previews, clay renders, things like that. So we've actually put together an entire um, behind the scenes reel, and I wanted to share that with you all. Can we get audio? Just pretend there's like a really cool beat happening right now. <laughs> What's up? Uh, shouldn't have been. I didn't. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Hey, 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 hey. Cool. Uh, so again, this, this, all of this work is being done, uh, Cinema 4D, Redshift. We're also using Houdini, um, and Houdini's workflow via Redshift into Cinema 4D is fantastic. Um, so we're super excited about all the advancements in technology. We're excited about Maxon acquiring Redshift um, and just really looking forward to be able to do bigger, better productions, uh, all the GPU rendering that's been happening lately. Um, as a team, we just can't even believe that we're able to do some of the things that we're able to do that like three years ago, I don't even think was on our radar. Um, but the, the technology keeps advancing and we're just having a blast doing it. Uh, and really thankful that we've got clients that, that value what we're doing. Uh, so thank you very much uh, for having me out. Mm -hmm.